Welcome to the first screencast for chapter one of our textbook called Principles of Life. First screencast dealing with the content of AP Biology. And in chapter one, what we're really going to be dealing with is the study of biology, what it is as a whole. But even greater than that, and more broad than that, is to study what characteristics of science and doing good science is all about. We'll hit each of these topics in much more depth when we encounter the specific content later on in the course. I want to be sure to encourage you now at the beginning of this that some of the slides we're going to, and some of the content here in this screencast, we're going to encounter and, and touch upon only briefly and move through rather quickly. So you always, always, always have the opportunity just to pause, to take a, take a look, take a closer look at all of the written material that are on these slides uh, because I'm not going to read each and every word on there. The first slide here is just the key concepts that the textbook covers in chapter one. And as you can see, there's five here. And any textbook or any reference material that you see are going to maybe give or take a key concept here, combine some, split some of these up. But these are the main uh, concepts or key concepts in the ch first chapter that, again, all deal with the study of biology, what that means, and on a greater extent, the study of science and science practices, which really is, includes the importance of what science is and what science isn't, and what it means to actually do, quote-unquote, good science. Biology itself, as you probably all know, can just simply be, be defined as the study of living things. Some of you are brand new to the study of biology. You haven't studied life since maybe your seventh grade life science course. And some of you are taking an AP course as a follow-up to the regular biology course that you took as a sophomore. But either way, we need to have a good working definition and understanding of what science is, what biology specifically is, and all of the components that are wrapped in or wrapped up in that. As I said with the key components or the objectives of this chapter as put forth by the textbook publisher, here in the next couple slides we'll look at characteristics that are shared by all living things. And again, you don't want to have blinders on and think that the world of biology revolves around our textbook called Principles of Life. So any other reference, any other, any other biology book or textbook that you encounter may have one or more um, differences in the number of characteristics of all of the things. And I think that's just important to point out. But take a look at these, these four on this slide and the ones on the next slide. Take a pause and read through them and uh, really appreciate that these are indeed characteristics of all living things. We might even find a few other ones out there or a way that another author might reword these or take one of them and split into two different characteristics, or combine a couple, none of that really matters. I'm not going to give you a blank sheet of paper and say, list all the characteristics that all living things share. But you certainly should appreciate how each of these are characteristics that living things have in common. Here are the second four for the total of the eight that our book references as characteristics that all living things share. A real important concept or cornerstone of studying biology is to understand the time period and the great length at which life has been developing on the face of the earth. You can get into the details. Um, we can come back and talk about this a little bit later, but we're going to focus on what the scientific community, what empirical studies show about life on earth. And it's an interesting slide here showing Showing life on Earth as perhaps, as, a, as an analogy, comparing it to a calendar or a month on a calendar. With each one of those days, roughly estimating about a 150 million years. And as you can see, at the very, very end of that month, in the last few minutes and seconds of that month, is when we're actually talking about ourselves, talking about humans and human-like species. But... Evolution, change over time, and development of life on Earth is a real important concept in the study of biology. 
everyone needs to know about cells as being the ultimate unit of life on earth, both structurally and functionally of all living things on earth. And a lot of this, some of these things that we encounter are going to just be vocabulary, and you'll get to encounter vocab in a lot of different ways, a lot of different media, but a couple important things are about cells in general, and knowing what organelles are, what some of them do, knowing the difference between cells that you and I are made out of, called eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the subtle differences that make quite drastic differences between different types of cells on Earth. We will look, again, more in-depth at the, at the relationships between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells and how they may have originated, how, how organelles, cell parts, may have originated by a process of endosymbiosis. Uh, it, a couple of the organelles that you need to know and need to be able to recognize in their importance as we study biology are the mitochondria, which is plural for mitochondrion, and the chloroplasts, because of their huge importance of the functioning of cells and how cells can obtain energy just for themselves, but often as a part of a greater organism, like you and I, for instance. As we continue to talk about the development of life on Earth, it involves this evolution, which means change over time. Again, we'll hit on it here and there in this initial screencast, but of course we will spend a lot of time of, with it as a unit in AP biology. Uh, mutations are a big part of that. You probably have some information, some knowledge about how genetics play a role in, in making individuals who they are, and a mutation is simply a, a change in the genetic code. It's like, it's like editing a document. It's like changing words around in a sentence. It's like changing spellings and rearranging letters in words. That can give rise to new finished products. You change a sentence, you change the whole paper, the whole document. Mutations play a big role in that. We need to be able to refer to binomial nomenclature as a as it pertains to scientific names. You're not going to memorize scientific names and Latin terminology just for the sake of memorization, but know that all living things have been categorized in a, in a hierarchy of naming, and we use a genus and a species name to identify specific organisms that exist on Earth. An example here, take a look, you probably know what Canis familiaris may mean, or Homo sapien for humans, and each identified organism on the face of the earth is given a distinct scientific name. That scientific name is used in part, or built in part, to help, to help compare relationships. A lot of things go into studying evolutionary relationships, not just the names that scientists give them, but of course the structural formula that make up organisms, uh, the structures, the chemicals, and especially the, the DNA and the genetical or the genetic makeup of organisms. We can use that to identify and talk about relatedness from one species to the next. And it's really important. I'm sure you've all seen uh, thing, you know, TV shows, kind of talk shows or courtroom dramas or, or mysteries, whatever they may be, where law enforcement uses genetic technology to identify individuals. Well, if we can compare, we can compare DNA from a suspect to a blood splatter at a crime scene, we can certainly use it to identify relationships between one species of bacteria to another species of bacteria. Along those same lines, then, we start to put things living things into groups. The three most broad categories of life on Earth are referred to as domains, and there's three different domains that we can fit all living things into. Now this continues to change. A uh, hundred and so years ago when I was studying science, this archaea domain didn't even exist. It was all single-celled organisms, 
and multicell organisms. But the processes and categorization in science continues to evolve and change. The relationship between the main structures that we would talk about when we discuss genetics and relationships between different organisms is to understand the, the relationship between DNA and genes and the actual proteins that lead to the traits that individuals have. So you need to be able to use this vocabulary and we'll continue to dive into it deeper through the course of AP Bio. We've already discussed or addressed mutations somewhat, but here again this is just a graphic showing you that a small change can change the entire outcome. If you take letters of any word and you just start rearranging them, you probably understand that that has to change the finished product. Just like if you start to take the main components of a DNA molecule and you change them and in the sense of a mutation it's a, most likely a mistake that is made and it can be caused by a lot of different things. The, the point is that the finished product is changed and altered. Another aspect of biology is looking at biological systems and how they might be organized. All the way from one extreme to the other we talk about the biosphere anywhere on the entire planet where life does exist from the deepest ocean, ocean trench to the highest mountain top and even into the atmosphere where life can be sustained and, and can be supported to the very smallest chemical component of life. The, the point on here where we actually say life begins is at the cellular level and as we move either direction we either get more specific or we get more broad in how we look at the interactions of living things. Metabolism. By itself a broad topic within studying life but it has to do with all of the chemical reactions that take place in life, in an organism. And there's two different types. We either take and break large molecules down into smaller molecules that can be used, which usually rele which does release energy, or we use energy to actually build up structures. A simple example of that is you taking a bite of a Big Mac from McDonald's and you break that down in your di through your digestive system into the small subunits of food, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, that your body can actually then turn around and build up into structures or use to energize the movements and other actions of the body. Homeostasis, that's arguably the most important physiological process in living things. It's, a, it's maintaining an equilibrium within a body even though the environment or factors outside the body are continually bombarding and changing and stressing a body. As simple as hot and cold reactions with human beings. It's hot outside, you will sweat. If it's cold outside, you will shiver. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, about an example for homeostasis. We will cover this in depth. No living things on earth exist in isolation. Virtually no populations exist in isolation. Instead, interactions from one organism to the next typically occur in communities. All of the populations that interact. Furthermore, in an ecosystem, we actually bring the non-living factors like soil types, precipitation, temperatures, amount of water, etc. Into the, into the conversation about factors that affect and interact with living things. Here's just examples of interactions of individuals, maybe individuals of the same species that compete with one another and individuals of other species that compete as well as having, for right now, a lack of a better way to say it, working relationships, give and take, where two organisms may both benefit from that interaction. The subset of biology that deals specifically with interactions of individuals and their environment, that's called 
ecology. And again, evolution, which simply means change over time, and specifically in the genetic makeup of populations, not individuals, we'll definitely explain that later, but it's a key component of studying biology. Um, many scientists say that studying life on Earth must be done in the light of evolution and change over time. Understanding the mechanism of evolution is certainly important. The mechanism being natural selection. Some of the misconception, the main misconception of what evolution is, is that people think that it has to lead to something better or that the species or groups of life on earth always get better. Well, it isn't about one day waking up all of a sudden with wings because having wings would be evolving. It's about, it's about traits and genetic traits that give an organism a better chance for survival are more likely to end up being passed on to the next generation. So it's populations that change over time that we can actually see from a season to season and certainly an annual basis on Earth. So to finish up the first screencast here is just to address what good science is. It's important to know that science is based on a method and it's based on testable questions and testable solutions. Science is empirical. And without even telling you what that word means by itself, this is an important thing to always know about science. Science isn't the only way to understand the world around us, but all science is empirical. If an explanation is not empirical, then that explanation isn't scientific. I want to be sure to be clear that it doesn't mean that the explanation is wrong or improbable or untrue. If it's not empirical, it simply means that it's not a scientific explanation. That's why we will stick to what science is in this classroom. We'll talk about good science being empirical and being based on testable predictions about how things will behave. If you can't set up a test to be run and not able to repeat it, then it's, we're not talking about science. I think it's important just to state that science and religion in particular are two examples of ways to know the world around us. But it's important to know that neither of them are equal to one another. Science seeks to explain the natural world. And religion has nothing to say about the material world. The beauty, personally, of that is that it is about belief. It's important to remember that just because an explanation of things are not science doesn't necessarily mean that they are untrue. And I'll leave you with this, that scientific advances contribute, contribute to life on earth for humans, help us to understand the way the world works. But they can't do everything, and they can't explain everything in the world around us. That is part of being a human.